in an effort to try to <clears throat> make it uh, more planable for everybody. Vic and I were talking the other day about getting some dates on the calendar for picnics, our, our community gatherings. And yeah, we did get a couple of those. You know, we were doing April 24th uh, next month. And then I'm going to have to look at my phone to tell you the rest of them. I don't remember. May, May 22nd. And that's probably good enough. I can give you through July if you're interested. But we had June 26th. Vic, why don't you come and do this? <laughs> we have June 26th and July 24th. So the... <laughs> No, we don't have August yet. You're on your own in August at this point. We don't have venues for all of those. I think in April we're just going to come back here again on April 24th. But just wanted to let you get those kind of in your mind and maybe on your calendar. So try to keep the dates clear. So we're going to talk about David. David is one of the most amazing characters of the Bible. We've, done, we've been talking about him for several weeks already, and my goal tonight is to talk about the quality or the characteristics of David's life. There's two statements found in Acts 13, both given by Paul as he's kind of preaching a little message there. <clears throat> he says in verse 22 of Acts 13, speaking about historical Israel and God's, <clears throat> God's um, record or history with Israel. There was a time when after Saul was king and he wasn't doing such a great job, God proclaims that he has found David, the son of Jesse, a man after my heart, who will do all my will. That's at the beginning of David's life. It was kind of said of him when he was a youth. It, that statement comes from, really, it looks to me like a combination of three verses, part of Psalm 89 and then two verses in, in 1 Samuel 13. So it looks like Paul's kind of pulling from all three of those and giving this declaration of God. It's still scripture. So this is God's assessment of David when he was still just a youth. He's a man after my heart who will do my will. And then later on in his message, Paul says of David that after he had served the purpose of God for his own generation, he fell asleep and was laid among his fathers and underwent decay. Those two statements kind of serve to frame David's life. They kind of act like bookends with the story of his life in between. One of them says he's a man who will do what I want him to do. He'll do my will. And at the end, he says, after he did that, he fell asleep. After he served the purpose of God. Now, I think most of us would like to have those things said of us, right? I would love for God to, to frame my life in those two comments. And I've been wondering, you know, this, this thing about David having a heart after God has been a statement that really has intrigued me for ever. And I always, I had this desire to know, what was it? What did David do? What, what was it about him that would cause God to describe David that way? His heart of repentance was usually the thing that I fell to by default but I was never really satisfied that, okay, that's it. That, you know, David just repented after his sin, and so God calls him a man after his heart. I think that's part of it, but it wasn't quite satisfactory. After talking to my friend John Hartman and my other friend Vic, I only have two friends, John and Vic. Um, I've come to the conclusion that Really what warranted this kind of definition or this kind of description of David's life was the mosaic of his life. It wasn't one event. It wasn't one 
situation. It was the, the, the sum of, of a man's life that God was describing with these kinds of statements. And I've come to understand God doesn't describe people. He doesn't define people by their sin. He didn't say, hey, I found David. You know that guy that sinned greatly with Bathsheba? He also doesn't define us by our accomplishments. He doesn't say, I found David the giant killer or David the mighty warrior. He doesn't say those things. He says, I found a guy who, who loves my heart, who's after my heart. And God really does see us. When Vic was just talking about that day when we're all standing and the Lamb of God is being revealed, and, you know, we are going to be looking around. I'm sure I'm going to be looking for Moses and David and you guys, people I know, be looking for, you know, looking around, trying to see. And they're not, we are not going to be defined by what we did or by our sin. We're going to be defined by our heart. God looks at the heart. Man looks at the outward and God looks at the heart. So it's the mosaic of David's life that we're going to try to capture a little bit tonight. We can't look at everything, but I've, you know, I've got a few points here that I just thought were, were worth kind of taking a look at. The first one being that he's a man who will do my will. This was said of David when he was young, after Saul had had been king for a while, and it didn't take Saul very long to kind of prove that he was not a man who would do the will of God. He was a guy that was going to do things his own way. When the, the prophet Samuel gave Saul some instruction in 1 Samuel 10, he told him very specifically, the word of the Lord is, you will go down to me before me, you'll go down to this place called Gilgal, and I'll come to you, I'll come down to offer the burnt offerings and the peace offerings, but you shall wait. You wait for me to get there. I'm the priest, you're the king. I'll come down and I'll show you what to do. Well, we know that Saul went down to Gilgal as he was instructed, but after waiting what he thought was a, a, uh, an appropriate amount of time, he decided to offer the burnt offering himself rather than wait for the priest, the prophet Samuel, to come and do it. When Samuel comes, he says, what did you, what did you do? Well, I, I, I was afraid. The people were getting restless, and I was afraid, so I offered the burnt offering, and Samuel tells him, you've, you've done foolishly. Had you kept the command of the Lord, and this is a puzzling statement to me, I'll be honest, had you kept the command of the Lord your God, which he commanded you, he would have established your kingdom forever. I don't really get that because the promise had already been given to the tribe of Judah that they would hold the scepter forever. Uh, Saul was from the tribe of Benjamin. But, you know, maybe God just knew what Saul was going to do and knew that it would end up with Judah. But the promise is, the word of the prophet is, if you had just done what the Lord had asked you to do, he would have established your kingdom forever. In other words, his sons would have been the procession of kings instead of David's sons taking that position. And Samuel goes on to say, but now your kingdom shall not endure. The Lord has sought out for himself a man after his own heart, and the Lord has appointed him ruler over his people. This is David. This is about a 14-year-old boy that he's talking about here. But what was God looking for? He wasn't looking for stature or um, achievements. He wasn't, you know, he certainly wasn't looking for somebody that had proven himself as a as a uh, a successful adult even. We're talking about a 14, 15-year-old kid and God says, "Well, I'm going to take him." He's Somebody that will do what I need him to do, what I want him to do. There was a second time Saul did not follow through on what the Lord told him. In 1 Samuel 15, 
He's told to go strike Amalek and utterly destroy all that he has. Do not spare him, but put to death both man and woman, child and infant, ox and sheep, camel and donkey. But Saul and the people spared Agag and the best of the sheep, the oxen, the fatlings, the lambs, and all that was good. They were not willing to destroy them utterly. But everything despised and worthless, they utterly destroyed. So Saul's deciding for himself what he's going to destroy and not destroy. God says, wipe it all out. See, he was taking, God was seeking judgment against Amalek for what Amalek had done to Egypt when they, or excuse me, Israel when they had come out of Egypt. They were one of the first people to come out and fight against Israel. And you remember the story when Moses was up in the mountain and every time he lifted his hands, Joshua would prevail. That, that was Amalek. So God's like, because of that, you got to go destroy him. Saul decides, well, okay. I will, but I'm going to keep the good stuff. And uh, again, Samuel comes to him and says, What'd you do now? Why didn't you obey God? Saul says, I did obey the voice of the Lord. I went on the mission the Lord sent me, and I've brought back Agag, the king of Amalek. Well, what did God say to do to him? He said, kill him, destroy him. Well, I br- so I brought him back. And I utterly destroyed the Amalekites. But the people took some of the spoil. You can see something about Saul here twice now. He's blamed the people for his disobedience. And he didn't follow through on what the Lord told him to do. He's looking for somebody who will. He's looking for David. This is the guy that at the end of his life, God is going to say of him, he was a man after my heart who fulfilled my purposes and his generation. The difference between David and Saul is that David follows, when God, he's given a command from the Lord, he does exactly what he was told to do. Saul leaves wiggle room in his obedience to God. You told me to utterly destroy him. I did. I went and I killed everybody. I just brought back some of the good stock, and I brought back the king as well. That's, well, that's not obedience. Partial obedience was not good enough. David obeyed fully, and that's why God is able to describe him as a man who is after my heart, a man who will fulfill my purpose. See, we don't always know. Maybe Saul didn't understand that God was wanting to destroy Amalek because of this word that he had given back in Exodus that he was going to punish Amalek for fighting against Israel. Maybe Saul knew that. Maybe he didn't know that. We don't always understand everything God is doing, and that's why complete obedience is imperative. Just doing what we were told to do, doing what God wants us to do, is the goal. And this is what, this is what earned David the accolades that he, that he received. So we have this clear distinction between David and Saul, and when David would humble himself and obey, he was fulfilling and completing God's will. And it's the difference. I always think about, you know, what does David say? It's like, you know, later on he'll come to say, I, I, I understand now, Lord, you want, what you, what you really want is a broken and contrite spirit. Because Saul, Samuel had to say to Saul, after Saul said, well, you know, we kind of obeyed. Actually, he says we did obey when they didn't. We, but we kind of obeyed. We just brought back some of the stuff. The people took some of the, the better livestock for themselves. And, and after all, we brought it back to offer a sacrifice to God with it. Excuses, excuses, excuses. You know, rationalization and explaining away your obedience. You know, that's what he was doing there. And Saul says, don't you understand? 
that it's better to give your obedience than it is to offer a sacrifice? You think God is happy with this sacrifice when it's a sacrifice of disobedience? Saul didn't know that. David did. David's like, I know what you want is a broken spirit. And I always, whenever I hear that kind of terminology, I think of horses. You know, you got these horses that walk around with their head reared up and bristly and uh, jumping around and just, you know, just everything about them says, yeah, go ahead and just try to put a saddle on me. And then you got horses that come up and they put their head down and they submit. And they let you put a saddle on them and they go where you tell them to go. That's the kind of spirit God is looking for in people. The Second Chronicles 16, 9 says his eyes roam the earth looking for that kind of heart. Then he found one in David. He said, I found David. Here he is. This guy will, will do my will. He'll submit. So I think that characteristic, that quality of David, that broken submission and humble obedience to the Lord is one of his qualities. It's part of the mosaic of his life. The second thing is that David sought deep repentance and restoration for his sin. I don't really want to spend a whole lot of time going over the story of David and Bathsheba. Most of us know it really well. It's gross, right? He takes the wife of one of his best friends. Uriah was one of his mighty men. David takes his wife, and then when... uh, He can't cover up his sin by bringing Uriah home. He decides, well, he decides to manipulate the situation of of war and, and essentially murder Uriah through, um, by putting him in in an impossible situation and having and having him killed. The prophet Nathan has to come to David and rebuke the king of Israel. Vic and I were talking about this the other day. You know, that's, that's not a healthy um, thing to do, to go in and rebuke the king. A lot of prophets who did that didn't live through the day, or they found themselves in prison, or in Jeremiah's case, he found himself in a pit. You know, it usually was not good practice to go in and tell the king, you're the man which is what Nathan did with David. But rather than get angry, what does David do? He repents. He knows, I messed up. And he, re- and he goes into a, a time of deep repentance. I want to read Psalm 51. Most of you probably know that Psalm 51 comes out of this time in David's life after he's been confronted about his sin with Bathsheba and Uriah. He says in verse 1 of Psalm 51, be gracious. Now compare this to Saul when Saul's confronted. Saul says, I did. I did do what I was supposed to do. The people are the ones who didn't listen. And David says, be gracious to me, O God. According to your loving kindness, according to the greatness of your compassion, blot out my transgressions. There's no excuses coming here. He's acknowledging and repenting of his sin. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity. Cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgression. It's always right here in front of me. It's against you, God, that I've sinned. And only against you. So that when you speak, you are justified. What he's really saying is you're right. You're right when you speak. when When you bring accusation against me, you're right. And you're blameless in that judgment. This is a guy who knows his sin. He's no, this is, there's no excuses. There's no spin. There's no blame shifting going on. He just comes to God and just says, I'm a sinner. And I 
put myself before a merciful and gracious God. Show me your love and kindness, Lord, according to your great compassion. Verse 5, Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin my mother conceived me. And now I know you desire truth in the innermost being. That's the, that's the no-spin zone, right? Samuel, uh, uh, Saul's trying to give spin, man. I, I, I did what you wanted, and the people are the ones who brought the sheep back. And David's saying, man, this, you want truth in here. There's no spin going on here. There's, there's no fooling God with this kind of stuff. And David knows it. He knows his God. Purify me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me to hear joy and gladness. Let the bones which you have broken rejoice. Hide your face from my sin and blot out my iniquities. See, not only does he know he's sinned, he knows he needs God's help to get through it and past it. In verse 10, he says, God created in me a clean heart. Renew a steadfast spirit within me. I need your help. I have sinned. I was brought forth in sin. My sin is always right in front of me. I never forget about it. I need you. Verse 11, do not cast me away from your presence. And do not take your Holy Spirit from me. You see what he's worried about? He's worried about his relationship with God. He's not worried about putting spin on his sin. He's not worried about what people think. It's like, Lord, I I need you. I've sinned against you. Give me a, a better heart and bring me back to your presence. Please don't take your spirit from me. That's what David's concerned about. No wonder the Lord says, this is This guy's after my heart. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and sustain me with a willing spirit. Give me that heart that wants to obey. This is what David's asking for. Then I'll teach transgressors your way and sinners will be converted to you. Deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God, the God of my salvation. And then my tongue will joyfully sing of your righteousness. You know what comes out of that understanding of that deep repentance and the understanding of God's grace and mercy is that worship Vic was talking about. You can't help but worship. In Luke 7, Jesus you know, there's a story of this lady who comes in and uh, starts wiping the Lord's feet with her hair and crying on his feet and cleaning his feet off with her tears. And he says, you know why she's doing this? Because she's been forgiven much. She was worshiping. You don't have to sing songs to worship the Lord. She was worshiping him by bowing at his feet and cleaning his feet with her tears and her hair. And it was elicited out of a place of repentance and an understanding of, you know, that she had been forgiven. It draws worship out of us. I've said this before, and I want to say it again. Repentance is a good thing. It's not, it's not a bad word. And it's not something that we have to be afraid of and say, I've done that already, and I don't need to hear about it anymore. Man, I love repentance. I'm so grateful that we have this God who rushes back to us every time every time we come to him, you know, with a repentant and broken heart. He just he runs to it. The sacrifices of God in verse 17 are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart. These things go God you will not despise he loves it way more than a burnt offering way more than a big tithe way more than anything we can do 
what he's looking for. What does he say in Isaiah? You know where I want to live? With that guy. That guy who has that broken and contrite heart. That's where I want to live. Not to the guy who gave the most money or the guy who has the biggest ministry, the biggest church. It's No, it's that guy right there. My eyes were searching the earth for that guy. And that's what David was. So when we say, yeah, I'd, I'd like for the Lord to describe my life and put those two comments around, you know, as bookends around my life. I think these are some of the things he's looking for. David had a willing heart. And he knew how to repent, and he was worried about his relationship with God. It's like, you know, Lord, forgive me and restore, restore that relationship. Restore to me your spirit and give me a clean heart and draw me back. Third thing is that David knew how to intercede for others. I think this is a godly activity or godlike activity. Second Samuel tells the story of David taking a census of Israel and Judah. First Chronicles twenty one gives a parallel account of the same story. And in both of them, um, well in one of them in Second Samuel it says God stirred David to take the sentence to census. In First Chronicles it says that Satan came and stirred up David to take the census. Uh, you figure that out. I don't know how to do that. Um, but in both cases, it says Joab, the commander of his army, says to him, uh, My lord, the king, may God increase your people a hundred times. But why do you want to do this thing? He knew it was a bad idea. And I think he's getting right at the, the heart of the issue. Why do you want to do this? And David should have stopped and he should have paused and said, let's see, why do I want to do that? But the scripture tells us that he just persisted and he's the king. So Joab goes out and takes the census. I think First Chronicles gives us a hint of what was going on because he, it says he went out and counted all the people. But with his report, he comes back and he says, you have 1.1 million soldiers in Israel and 470,000 soldiers in Judah. Kind of like that's really what you wanted to know, isn't it? How big is my army? How powerful am I as a king? That's what David was taking pride in his soldiers and in the size of his army. And God was not pleased about it. It says, you know, it says from morning till the appropriate time. I don't know what that is, if that's all in one day or, or what it is. But it, within some relatively short period of time, the Lord sends a plague that kills 70,000 soldiers in Israel. So 70,000 of the 1.1 million die. And David realizes he has a problem. He looks up and he sees the angel of God on his way to Jerusalem to start killing the the soldiers in, in, uh, of Judah. And when the Lord says, wait a minute, maybe he's had enough. It might be good enough. Well, David is scared and, you know, well, I'll get to that in a minute. There's another prophet in David's uh, administration or in his cabinet guy called Gad, and he comes to David and he says, hey, look, here's what you got to do to get this thing to stop. You got to go up to the threshing floor of Arona, the Jebusite, and build an altar to stop this plague. You know, just by the way, on a side note, when we're reading these things sometimes and you're reading through the scripture and you come to these names that are hard to pronounce and you don't know how to do it, especially when you're reading publicly, it gets to be a little frustrating trying to do it. Well, I looked up Arona. It's A-R-A-U-N-A-H. I thought, how, do you, how would you really say this in, in Hebrew? And it was something like, ha-ha-nev. And I thought, no, what? You look at A-R-A-U, none of us would have come up with ha-ha-nev. So 
It doesn't matter how you pronounce them. Just read it however you want to because none of the rest of us know how to do it either. Yeah, so anyway, this guy, I, I, I would say Arauna, A-R-A-U-N, has this threshing floor. And, da- and Dave, So David goes up to, uh, to, to build an altar on it, and this man sees the king coming, and he, he just says, you take whatever you want. You know, it's probably nerve-wracking when you see the king walking up to your house, right? It's like, what, what could he want here? And he says, I need to build an altar on your threshing floor. And the guy's just like, well, take what you need. Just take the threshing floor. Take the, there's oxen over there to sacrifice. You can burn their yokes for wood. Whatever you got to do, just take it. And David says, no. There is no way I will offer something to the Lord that didn't cost me anything. I'll, I'll buy it from you. And that's the only way this is going to happen. So David knows there's something in the heart of David you know, I think it would be pretty tempting, wouldn't it? If you're told, you know, let's, here's what you got to do. You got to go do this thing. I mean, it's it's a little unrelatable to us to think about going and building an altar and offering sacrifices to God. It's, it's hard for us to relate to that. And I don't know what example to use that's relatable to it necessarily. But just imagine you're told to do something by God and Somebody comes along and, and makes it easy. Well, yeah, here, just use whatever you need. Take my oxen, take the yoke, and use the threshing floor. Whatever you got to do, you would, it would be easy to think, well, that's just God making provision for me. Or hey, it's kind of nice. It won't cost me anything. You know, I, get, I, gotta, here, I got the supplies I need to do this. It would be really easy to see that as, as some kind of uh, benefit and just go along with that idea. Yeah, okay, thanks, I'll take the oxen. There's something in the heart of David that said, no way, I'm not going to offer a sacrifice to God that doesn't cost me anything. So there was, there was something, again, we see something in, in the man's heart something about his relationship to God and his understanding of God that he's only going to give the Lord his best. He's not going to look for cheap, you know, cheap offerings. He's giving them the best of the best. And it's, it's like, I'm, I'm going to, it's going to cost me. He ends up giving them 50,000 shekels or 50, whatever it is. I don't, I don't know how much money it is. I didn't bother to figure it out. But it was probably substantial. And he wants, he wants to only offer God that which is his and that which cost him something. Reveals something about David's heart. Later on, David stands up before the Lord in the same story. The Lord's bringing the pestilence or the plague on people and, and people are dying. And David stands up and says, it w- Is it not I who commanded to count the people? I'm the one who has sinned and I have done wickedly. But these sheep, what have they done? O oh Lord, my God, please let your hand be against me and my father's household but not against the people. That's amazing. Because God's killing people. And what David is saying is, kill me instead of them. Leave them alone and kill me. And I, I don't, he doesn't know at this point if God will do it or not. He could have. This is, this is very... Godlike. We see Moses do something very similar in Exodus 32 when God says, Moses, I'm done with these people. Stand aside. Let me wipe them out. I'll take you, instead of Abraham's seed, I'll take you and build a, a nation out of you, and we're just going to start over. And Moses stands in the gap and, and says, don't do that. Pleads for the people. What does Jesus do? You know, God 
And it's like, you know, we have a problem. Now. We have sin in the land. We have sin as sin has entered into this, this human situation now, and they all deserve to die. And Jesus says, don't kill them. Kill me. This is what David is doing right here. This is a godly thing to do. And it's hard. <laughs> yeah, it's hard. But it's what a shepherd does. In John 10, Jesus is talking about, I'm the good shepherd. I don't run when the wolf comes to get the sheep. The guy who's a hireling and not really a shepherd, when, when the wolf comes to get the sheep, he runs. David could have just gone and hidden. He could have gone into his palace and hidden and just waited for the plague to be over. And God probably would have spared him because he's the king and he had a, a covenant relationship with a covenant promise from God. But he didn't do that. He, he jumped in the gap and, and uh, protected the sheep. He, he, was, he was a shepherd by trade, wasn't he? He knew how to fight lions and bears when they came to get his sheep, put his own life on the line. He had experience with this. And at this point in time, he stands up before the Lord and says, Take it out on me. I'm the one who did this. Kill me and my father's household and, and leave the sheep alone. There's something really powerful about the guy's heart that's revealed in these things. And the idea that, you know, he's not going to offer God any kind of cheap sacrifice and he's not going to let the sheep be slaughtered without putting his own life on the line in exchange for their life. Those attitudes, I believe, are part of the mosaic of David's life. When you weave all this together, you get, the, you get a picture of a man whose heart is seeking after God, seeking the things of God. And, and so I think, you know, it's good for us to remember our lives are not defined by our mistakes. And our life, they're not defined by our achievements either. God is looking at the heart. There's a, there's a statement in, in Luke 16 that says, <clears throat> the things that are highly esteemed by men are despised by God. And, and that, what, if you read it in context, what it really is saying is that the same event can be highly esteemed by men and despised by God. Why? Because man is looking at the outward appearance and they're looking at the achievements. Oh, you built this, this beautiful edifice. You built this, I hate to say it, but you built this huge ministry and it looks really good to men. It's admired <clears throat> and... Um, praised by men. <clears throat> and I'm not saying this always happens, but it's possible that God could look at it and despise it because he's looking at what the motivation is and what the heart really is. <clears throat> this is <clears throat> God, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> he really is the no spin guy. He's, he's looking at hearts. And that's what he saw in David. That's what he that's how he describes David. There was a guy that would seek my heart. He seeks to do what I want him to do. He'll do what I ask of him. He repents when he sins. <clears throat> and he stands in the gap for other people. And one more quick thing is this. <clears throat> First Chronicles 17 says, It came about when David dwelt in his own house, that David said to Nathan the prophet, I'm dwelling in a house of cedar, but the ark of the covenant of the Lord is under curtains. Listen to me, he says in another chapter, my brethren and my people, I intended to build a permanent home for the ark of the covenant of the Lord and for the footstool of our God. In other words, David wants to build a place for God to dwell. He's concerned 
about that. It reminds me of the verses in Ephesians 2. There Paul talks about us all being built up into a spiritual dwelling in the, of, of the Lord, a dwelling, <clears throat> a dwelling of God in the Spirit. That's what we are. And collectively, we become that when each one of us assumes this place of having a broken and contrite spirit. As Isaiah tells us, that's where God wants to live, is with that guy. I want to live with the guy who's who's broken and who's contrite. And when we do that as a community, we're doing the same thing David wanted to do. David thought it was a, a physical structure. Today we know that God's looking for a spiritual house, and he dwells with those who are broken, humbled, and contrite, not people who don't make mistakes. We're going to make our mistakes. We all have and we all will. You're not looking for people who accomplish great things. Maybe we will accomplish great things, according to who's deciding if it's great or not. But what he's really looking for is just that that broken heart, that broken spirit, that, you know, that, that place that just says, Lord, I'm not going to make excuses. I'm going to own my sin and just ask for forgiveness because I know you're, you're full of loving kindness and compassion. Help me not do it anymore. And then we live in a place of understanding that we want to be like Christ. And this, this to me, just defines such a tremendous community. Is what we're going to get into in Philippians is having an attitude that y'all are more important than I am. And if I have to stand in the gap for you guys and give up my own life for you, then I'm going to do it because you're more important than I am anyway. And when we all embrace those kind of hearts, we've got a dwelling place of God. Man, he will, he'll be all over that. <laughs> you know, he just... Because that's what he is. That defines God. It describes God. And I think David is a man who had those things working, even though he blew it big. Probably worse than any of us have. But he came back to God in, in honesty, truth in here. This is what he says. I know what you're looking for. You're looking for truth in here. And that's what David would come back to God and uh, present to him as an offering. I know that's what he wants more than our sacrifices. He wants that truth. That mosaic of David's life earned him the description of a man after God's heart. I pray that we all become that. So, we'll pray. Lord, we just, we do come to you and we acknowledge that we can only do things through the power of your spirit. God, we ask, like David did, will you create in us clean hearts? Will you renew <clears throat> a steadfast spirit in us, God. Do it, do it in me. Do it in each one of us, Lord. Give us as a community clean hearts and steadfast spirits. Restore the joy of our salvation to us, God. Give us hope and joy in the work that you're doing in us. Lead us in a better way, Lord, and <clears throat> let the fruit of your spirit be born in our hearts and in our lives. God, will you create love in us and joy and hope, peace and patience and the things, all the things that you are, will you create those in us and give us hearts <clears throat> that love the way you love. 
hearts that break over the things that break your heart and hearts that rejoice in the things that you rejoice in. Lord, we're asking you to make us into a, a, a dwelling place for your spirit. I know we're that now, God, but you can increase it. And you can lead us into a place where, <clears throat> where you can dwell among us. Lord, we, we just desire to see the evidence and the fruit of your presence every time we get together. Will you join us and be here with us? Make us into a people that love you deeply and serve you in truth, serve you in, um, in just complete submission and obedience. Forgive us for our mistakes, God, and forgive us when we err and sin. And lead us back to restoration and repentance. We're so grateful that you're a, a God full of loving kindness, a God full of mercy and grace. What would we do if you weren't? But this is your self-described qualities, and we're grateful to you for that. God, and I just pray that you would bless each person here and each family and let them take the presence of your spirit back to their homes and let it bear fruit in each house, in each family, even in the members of our family that are not saved. Let them see the, the joy and the presence of God in our lives and let it draw them to you, God. I ask those things in Jesus' name. Amen.